Okay. I think, okay. All right, it is recording. We're right. on the air, sort of. And uh, on the air. Yeah, welcome to the show that has no name. I am your host, Panyo Basa, and this is my special guest, Otto Excelsior. And he has probably read more books than anybody that I know. <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, you've read lots of books. You're into them there, book learnings. I do enjoy books. I do. Yeah. And so uh, I thought we would uh, discuss books in general and in particular, like the, the spiritual power of books. For example, um, most of my philosophical teachers, uh, in a sense, the spiritual or religious teachers that I've had in my life have been books. You know, I was converted to Buddhism well, by a book. I was converted to Theravada Buddhism in particular by a book. Some of the most important teachers I've had with regard to teaching me what I was ready to hear that I needed to hear have come in the form of books. And so since you've read so many of them, I thought maybe we could uh, discuss books and uh, just the uh, their spiritual power, their like transformative power, the, their power to, you know, modify our lives, preferably for the better. Yeah, it's, it's hard to think of books, you know, modifying your life for the worse, although I assume some people have <laughs> read the Book of Mormon or something. And, uh, well, you know, Mormons are nice people. <laughs> Mein Kampf, I don't know. Well, National Socialist the Red Book, you know, the Communist <laughs> Manifesto. Well, there we go. That might have uh, done some uh, more damage than good, but yeah. But people mean well. People mean well. Well, yeah, um, well, I, 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 I am. Um, I have to say, once you mentioned that, I too um, have learned a lot from books, and I think I was I was brought to uh, Eastern philosophy in general and Buddhism in particular uh, through books, and um, books have a power. As somebody pointed out, you can learn about life from great literature um, the same way you learn about life by living in it. And this is not just learning about like um, the physical aspects, but also the, the importance of, of ethical, moral, and spiritual aspects of life. And I think that there are some books that are very powerful that way, and yeah. in a universal way. Yeah, and it can be fiction also. Like, for example, I've met a few people if they read anything, it has to be nonfiction. If they watch any kind of movie, it has to be a documentary, you know, all nonfiction, as right. though fiction is just a waste of time, you know, mental masturbation or some such. But yeah. really, I mean, a really great novelist, you know, like Dostoevsky, for example, they can just condense and crystallize what you need to learn from life. In, mm -hmm. in it's, I mean, it's a fictional setting, but then again, from a, like an Eastern point of view, this is just a larger fictional setting right. we're yeah. already in. So it's just like a small universe that has its own validity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, I think of uh, Shakespeare, and I'm a, I'm a bardaholic. I, uh, one of the, the few things that I've kept, I've moved around a lot over the years, I've lived a lot of different places, slept on couches, I've always had a copy of Shakespeare with me. And um, when a writer, Dostoevsky, Shakespeare, um, there's a, and I would say Gene Wolfe um, yeah. can show you things about yourself and give you, and again, it's, it doesn't really replace real life experience, but it can give you a guide to help you get through that real life experience better. And when you find yourself in a situation and you realize you're asking the same questions um, as, uh, you know, a powerful character in, in, in one of these stories is asking. So yeah, fiction definitely has its place. And I think sometimes fiction is a better way to present some ideas and concepts. Although I, you know, I can sympathize with the person that refuses to read fiction. I mean, I think that that's more of a taste thing. I mean, there's some fiction that I tend to stay away from, uh, just as there's some, uh, film, you know, I tend to, I, I tend to not really be interested in watching anything except comedy for some reason. And I think that's, because um, something like a film has such a direct impact on you, um, it's almost hypnotic. Um, one, of, one of my early experiences I remember was sitting in a room with people watching television. And I didn't watch the television, I watched the people watching the television. It's very instructive. And movies are much the same way. And um, books are similar, but with a book you, you can put it down, stop, consider things, go back. And, and, of course, we have to keep in mind, too, that 
we're reading to ourselves silently for the most part. This is a relatively new way to read. And I think this is a, a technique of reading that actually um, facilitates the kind of mental change and insight that's possible. In the old days, you would simply have a book read to you. You know, I've been reading, I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce his name, Aulus Gellius uh, wrote a book called Attic Nights. And this is basically a collection of these little vignettes that were designed to be read to like, uh, you know, uh, late empire Romans uh, reclining around pretending they were Greeks. And, uh, you know, and, uh, was memorized the Iliad and Odyssey who comes yeah, yeah, and instead like, of the flute girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, yeah, we, we were the Trojans. We're, we're part of your we're part of your history. Um, so, um, yeah, I think there was a, a big change when people began silently reading. I think books then made more of an impact on people. Yeah, I think to some degree, for some people anyway, the, the refusal to uh, read or watch anything but nonfiction is a kind of limitation in that it, um, they're they're just naturally assuming that this is reality. What do oh, you, I see what you mean? Yeah, yeah. So they yeah. just want to learn about reality and not waste their time with make believe. But um, still, I mean, this is itself a kind of make believe, seems to me. And like we were already mentioning, I mean, you can learn important things from uh or or just uh like a a deeper a deeper appreciation of what you already know from reading okay. you know from reading whatever like dostoevsky's the idiot for example which is my favorite novel i think although uh um i would like to say that uh, of the books you have sent me the two that i've really read from cover to cover are now two of my favorite books oh so okay. Which is uh, the book of the new sun by Gene Wolfe, and also this one, which is uh, this is uh, very, very I have instrumental. Feeling that that one would uh, strike a chord with you. I, I I I have I do flatter myself that I can kind of match people with books fairly well sometimes. And yeah, I I like books that fill in gaps. You know, you've got like this void of ignorance on a certain okay. subject, maybe, or else you just you just know certain things, but you can't really reconcile them or integrate them. And then you read a book that just gives you this onslaught of information about stuff that you never really considered before. And this this uh, this book is one of them. Also, strangely, I, I've got some books here on the table here. This yeah. one, which I, I picked up in a used bookstore in Mandalay in Burma, Strategy, The Indirect Approach Ooh. by B.F. Little Heart. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like, he, he does sort of like a strategic play-by-play -play of the most influential battles in history. And uh, like at least half of what I know about World War I and the Civil War, <laughs> I, I got from this. Wow, cool. That sounds, yeah. it sounds like the name of some retired British brigadier. Uh, actually, I think he never made it past the, the, the level of captain. Wow. And then he retired after World War II, I think, you know, he, he dropped out of and became a civilian again and became like the military editor for the Encyclopedia Britannica. Nice. And he was he was trying to come up with um, um, at that time, tank warfare and air warfare were still relatively new, especially okay. tank warfare. And so he was using uh, like cataphracts, like heavy uh, armored inf uh, cavalry. Right. from ancient times and, and basing new tank strategies on that. And he was the one that came up with the idea that the Germans could invade France through the Ardennes. And it was ignored by the British, but the Germans were avidly reading the, the British military <laughs> journals. And that's where they got the idea was from, from this guy, not this book in particular. But from this guy. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you got to pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, somebody read books and uh, that was the result. But um, I think fiction and nonfiction both have their place. But I'll tell you, the book that actually that I first read that sparked my interest in uh, Buddhism was uh, Siddhartha by Herman Hesse, and certainly a fictional book, and one that at the time impressed me. Going back to it later, I can see its limitations in some ways. But um, yeah, I think fiction can be a very important, you know, a, a fictional book doesn't have to necessarily be earth shaking. It can also point you in a direction uh, like little stepping stones. Um, so there, there are there are, you know, smaller and larger uh, stepping stones. You know, some of them are just like basically barely under the water and others you come to these big boulders that are like, wow, this is going to take me my life to explore this, you know, entire island. So mm -hmm. but, um, what other books have you got there? Oh, let's see. I've got the first 
really important book that I ever read. It was the first paradigm shifter, which um, I got it as a monk. I found it on a, in a book stall in Rangoon years and years ago. And the cover had like a naked man and a naked woman on it, which got removed because I was a monk and wasn't supposed to think that. But here's the back cover. The Naked Eight by Desmond Morris. Oh, you know, I don't think I've ever read that. Yeah, I read it when I was like 14 years old. And it was just such a mind blower at the time because it's, I mean, he's a zoologist and um, he describes the human animal as though it were just another species of animal, like the mating habits and all this sort of thing. And right. it was really a mind blower because as a kid, you know, you just assume there are people and then there's animals and you don't really consider yeah, people yeah. a kind of animal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We're yeah. an ape, right? Yeah, the so. naked ape. Yeah. It's, so, so that's so he really describes a lot of things like in the I think it was the first or second chapter. You know, he's he's explaining stuff that most people never even consider. Like, like, why is it that human beings don't have fur except for in a few limited areas? You know, it's like, mm-hmm. why is that? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, why do we have a nose that pokes out like this when most animals don't have like a protruding proboscis like this? Or why do we have like the, the lining of our mouths turned inside out around the edges, which mm-hmm. is actually, uh, you know, there's, it's more prone to damage from sun or from injuries and that sort of thing. But it, it does have survival value. And so there's a lot of like uh, Darwinian sexual selection involved and so forth. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. So that was that was a really important one for me. It, it kind of got me a little more philosophical, you know, at the age of about 14. And another one that I picked up at a used bookstore in Mandalay was is this one, Battle for the Mind by William Sargent. And this was definitely, I mean, this was a paradigm changer. This really? wonderful book, yeah. And what it's, was that? Uh, um, he starts off talking about Pavlov's dogs, where a lot oh. of people don't realize that Pavlov... I mean, the whole making dogs slobber when he rang a bell was just very limited. He didn't work on that for very long. Mostly what he was doing was he was um, essentially giving dogs PTSD by like giving them electrical shocks and so forth, and then trying to cure them of, of their neurotic symptoms. And he found that with dogs, um, you know, they're they're all messed up. You know, he can zap them with electricity until they're just like, shivering in a corner of their cage pissing on themselves you know right. just cowering you know and he would try to cure them and he found that um it's very i mean the old adage you can't teach an old dog new tricks is, is wrong i mean you can teach an old dog new tricks it's unteaching them the old tricks that is difficult you know huh. once they get a habit going it's very difficult to break the habit unless you give them a breakdown they hit this emotional crisis where their habitual way of dealing with life doesn't work anymore. And then all of a sudden, it's like a, it's like an instinct in, in higher mammals that they become very open to suggestion. And yeah. it works that way with humans, too. That's how Chinese thought reform works. You know, you just put them in this very stressful, difficult situation until they just have a, like a mental breakdown. And then you've got the, the commissar or the propaganda minister or you know, right, whoever right. it is. Mentoring he's the only yeah. person you're allowed to talk to. And he just feeds in the right views or, or even like military training, um, you know, where the, the recruits are just broken down. Everything they do is wrong. They got to do 100 push-ups for, you know, just like put, having their hands in their pockets, you know, anything like that. And yeah. then they build, build them back up into fighting machines that don't question and order. A lot right. of the, uh, the manhood rituals of uh, so-called, you know, like hunter-gatherer society. Yeah. Where oh, they yeah. just get the the bejesus scared out of them, and they've got to go through this this harrowing ordeal in order to become like this, you know, you know, a member of the tribe kind of a thing. And um, not only and uh, like the the Soviet Union, especially under Stalin, would not only use this kind of stuff like their interrogation techniques um, and just the way they would treat prisoners would not only get them to confess to trying to overthrow the government, but get them to actually believe yeah. that they were over- trying to overthrow the government. And it, it works that way in religion also. So it's like in order to, to be born again, you've got to hit a crisis point. You know, you've got to hit this point where, um, you know, the way you've habitually dealt with life just doesn't work anymore. And then you, you hit the crisis and then uh, you're very open to suggestion and you can change easily. So that was really an important one for me because it makes a lot of sense. You know, it brings all these different uh, di- seemingly disparate uh, phenomena right. together under the same 
um, rubric. Right, right. Some some t early technologists of the mind um, somehow or other recreated the um, the traumatic experience that someone may have had that led them to some sort of an epiphany. And, it, and everyone from the Australian Aborigines who need to socialize their teenagers to get to to obey the rules all the way to the Chinese Communist Party, which needs to socialize people to get them to obey their rules, are using the same techniques that are apparently hardwired into us. Yeah, and the, the guy who wrote the book, he started off um, treating, he was a doctor who was treating uh, World War II combat veterans who still had what's now called PTSD, it used to be called you know, combat fatigue. Oh, you know, right. World War One, it was shell shock. World War II, it was combat fatigue. And he found that having them re relive the experience of, you know, being caught in a burning tank or seeing their best friend's head get blown off, you know, through hypnosis or whatever, would could trigger the crisis point where then you could steer them in a, in a better direction. And then he found that if it was just too traumatic, they just could not bring themselves to remember it. Just have them remember something similar oh. was good enough. Oh, okay. And I can't remember, I can't remember the psychological term for the, that kind of treatment, but even shock therapy is similar where you give them the insulin shock or the electric shock. And that brings about the kind of crisis that then makes it easier to, to treat them. I'm, you know, what I know of uh, secret society initiations, um, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with the, the uh, initiation for those who become a master mason. And Freemasons out there, I, I'm not a mason, I'm not obligated to any secrets, so don't write in or, or flame or anything. And This is all find outable by anyone with a re access to a halfway decent reference library. So Yeah, you know, or just read War and Peace. Yeah, well, there you go. So, but in, in that, of course, um, someone is, is frightened unto death. You know, the whole point of it is to, to have someone go through the whole idea of being killed and then with the idea of being resurrected. And of course, the original nowadays, I don't really believe that it's probably very traumatic. But in the old days, they used to throw you down a well and, uh, you know, do their utmost to convince you that you're going to die. Yeah. And so, um, but I, I can't help but think that someone must have gone through this themselves originally and then realized that they had had a, a profound alteration in their consciousness and apparently feeling that it was for the better. And then they, they just had to recreate it artificially to do it on a systematic level. And, you know, when you brought up the initiatory societies, it's important to remember that this was these so-called secret societies. Every single person in the tribe went through this. It really wasn't all that secret, you know, almost like the, uh, you know, uh, early 19th century America, small town where every single adult male over the age of 21 was a member of the local lodge. So yes. it was secret, but it's not really all that secret. It was it was a way of social. Well, it was kind of secret to the kids that were having to go through the right. ceremonies. Right, right, yeah, yeah. They were the ones having the bejesus scared out of them. Oh, I, I just imagine those kids, uh, the Hopi kids with the kachinas coming out and dragging them off. Yeah. To initiate them, stuff like that. Or and um, similar things happen, like in the like the therapeutic mysteries of like the ancient Greece. Where you oh, go into the cave, you know, you'd have to fast and everything beforehand. You take the hellebore and go into the cave and all that sort of oh, thing. Oh yeah, yeah, like the cave of Trophonius. The, the scare you, scare you healthy. The, the even the the reports we have of the uh, uh, Trophonius, um, the uh, oracle, are, are, is confused. But apparently, you'd, you'd fast and ate the special food, and they would you put your feet in a hole and we would get dragged down. Yeah, yeah. It, this book has a it has a chapter written by Robert Graves who. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, do you think that that uh, the Naked Ape was one of the books that uh, directed you towards uh, studying biology? Well, I always liked animals before that, but thinking of human beings as an, as an animal, animal. <laughs> as a species that was a new of thing. animal, that I mean, even like in, when I write blog posts, I've written quite a lot about that, especially a couple years ago. Just um, the the whole idea. I think it's a scandal of of 20th century psychology, where it was supposedly common knowledge that human beings didn't have animal instincts. You know, we'd replace that with, with culture and, and so, intellect right. reason. Yeah. But um, I mean, we're just loaded with animal instincts. I mean, we've probably got more instincts than the average animal does. Oh yeah. And when a lot of these instincts are driven biologically. Yeah. Well, all of them are, they'd have to be, you know, it's, it'd be hormonally influenced or else just like hardwired right into the brain, yeah, yeah. you know, like any kind of emotional response. It would be instinct, you know, and we've so, got you know, special areas in the brain and hormones and stuff that, that help to uh, condition that, you know, boys liking girls. I mean, it's not like you have to learn that. I mean, it's or oh, preferring, oh. 
preferring sweet food to bitter food, you know, preferring the smell of baking bread to a, a cat fart, you know, I mean, that's all that sort of thing, stuff is instinctive. It's not like it just culturally conditioned. It's, it's universal throughout the human race. Laughing when something's funny, you know, it's, it's just instinct. Laughter is interesting. Well, um, from a Jamesian perspective, I'm bringing in Julian James again. I can't help it. He always is coming up. He saw laughter as a non-lethal way of social control. And that's why I was selected for it, because if you pe people didn't behave and, and it really, uh, I would say that whether his his neurological model is correct or not is, is beside the point. I think it's an interesting point that in an ancient society, when everybody's supposed to be doing something and someone does the wrong thing, well, you can hit them or kill them. But that's actually counterproductive. But if you laugh at them and shame them, this is a way of getting them even in a, even in a, uh, I would even dare say a pre uh, verbal society, you could still have some kind of mocking um, sound that you would make to get them back into the groove and doing what they're supposed to do at that moment. So um, I would see where laughter would have quite a survival value and why you'd want to hardwire that. So you think laughing is was originally designed as mockery? Well, as well, not as well. Who, yes, designed by God and Darwin. I don't know about design, but um, that well, the idea, and again, this is James's idea, but it makes sense to me. Is if you if you want to compel social cohesion in a non-lethal way, you can laugh at someone. So you uh, evolved the idea that someone doing the wrong thing is funny, ha ha, and the person who is being laughed at obviously doesn't like to be laughed at. They might feel mocked. I, again, these are very sophisticated feelings. I'm just using these words because this is what we use, but um, that it was unpleasant to be laughed at and pleasant to laugh at someone. And no, this, but didn't, didn't it like a, like a guy who tells funny stories would also be more successful with the girls, I suppose. Well, it's telling funny stories. This is this is a level of sophistication. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about even like a pre a pre. Um, I don't want to say pre-verbal pre pre language, as we understand it, society. A way, some way of, and even in the an early language society, James feels that you know our ruminative consciousness is an artifact of language, um, which is not too far from some Buddhist ideas, and indeed what I myself have experienced under sufficient LSD. So. Um, I, I think that the la the laughter was again um, a a good way to because it's fun to laugh and obviously you know we know laughter is healthy for you it makes you feel good it releases endorphins and it's also a way to maintain social cohesion and again in a non lethal way instead of killing the person that gathers sticks on the Sabbath it would have been better if everybody just laughed at him a little bit like he's gathering sticks on the Sabbath and that yeah. way he'd, he'd stop doing that but you'd still have the guy there you know. I, I see it just as a kind of nonverbal communication, you know, like chimpanzees yeah. have a similar kind of sound yeah. they make. Or even, even rats, I've read that even like rats have sort of a laughter sound that they make when they're playing. That's interesting. How do the other chimps um, respond to laughter? Is it used in, in that kind of a... I think it's just mental states are contagious, you know, it's just if one one person is laughing, that means, you know, everything's good. Yes. More likely to, yeah, yeah. people will laugh. So in, in like uh, in the, in the Naked Ape, it talks about laughter. How it's, he's yeah. his theory was that he, it evolved from crying. It's just the sound you make when you're crying, except broken up into shorter bursts, and with you know without so much uh, of the uh, the tear duct action and and so right. forth. And um, I had my own theory about laughter. It was, uh, um, you you invest a certain amount of mental energy in making sense of something. And then when you get hit the punchline or whatever, and all of a sudden the the sense you know, evaporates, you know, it's just it it's like you have this serious, uh, you know, um, like an excess of energy. Well, it's a certain amount of energy is sort of you know taking something seriously, and then when all of a sudden the the grounds uh, for for taking it seriously just evaporate, just disappear, then this excess energy just you know comes out in like nervous laughter or whatever. That's interesting about laughter being close to tears. And of course, you know, extreme emotions tend to flip over quickly. You know, yeah, some excess of laughter, I see excess of sorrow weeps, excess of uh, joy. No, excess of joy weeps, excess of sorrow laughs. Yeah, sure. it's one of the proverbs of hell. He's starting to talk about Democritus soon. And uh, <laughs> the laughing philosopher, what was it? Um, People say, why do you laugh? Because I know. And people say, how do you know? Because I laugh or something like that. 
but uh, no, I, I, I'm now you got me interested in that chimp thing. I'm going to start looking into that because I, I just wonder if there's films. I'd just be interested to see how the laughter, um, you know, how the laughter was passed between them and the, how the other chimps relax and under what circumstances it starts. Yeah. So since we're talking about um, like pivotal paradigm changing books, I mean, what would be like one of the main ones for you? Hmm. Well, hard to say. Well, let's divide it up between fiction and nonfiction. Um, a fiction book, one, one of the books that really, uh, thinking back to like books that really bowled me over and started me thinking about things differently, would be Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, interestingly enough. Um, and uh, this is a book that Gene Wolfe uh, wrote a wonderful uh, essay about, um, which um, I, I, I actually hadn't thought about it in the years I read the essay and it made me realize what that book really did. It showed me um, a different way of looking at the world. You know, I was like a lot of people in my generation brought up in a, um, a sort of a, I'm not going to say a woke household, but a, a kind of a lefty, um, spiritually empty, um, atheistical, agnostical kind of a worldview. Um, the idea was to not give me any ideas about spirituality or religion until I was old enough to decide for myself. And so um, whenever I had any religious or spiritual questions, I would always be answered very, very vaguely, um, leaving me with a very vague kind of idea of spirituality and thus ethics and morality. Um, you know, people coming from out of the 60s and 70s for the most part had a uh, not what we would call a, an actual morality, more like situational ethics, you know, what's going to make me feel good at the time, because we all know if there's no God, ultimately, there's no um, objective reason to do or not do anything. I mean, it, it eventually mm -hmm. does lead to, I mean, and, and you know, pake, which is Latin for pace, uh, you know, arguments about the, the uh, you know, I, I know that Buddhism as a, you know, officially not having a creator God does provide these things, but you know what I mean. In the West, certainly, there's uh, been a big void that way. So when I read Lord of the Rings, um, I remember just being touched in ways. It's, it's very hard to even say, um, put into words, except it, it made me aware of a larger world and a, a larger way of looking at things. And um, that's one of those books that I go back to again and again. And like that uh, quote by Stanislaus Lem, I'm not looking for what's in the book. I know that very well. I'm looking for myself from like, oh my goodness, uh, something like 40 years ago. Uh, probably when I first read the book, and uh, it made a big impression on me. But it's it made an impression on me on a lower level, you know, not not a not an intellectual impression, but more of a um, I don't want to say heart chakra because it's going to make me sound so new agey. You know, it, subliminal, if you like, yeah, yeah, uh, sub, subliminal with my eyes wide open. Um, and, and other fictional books. Um, well, then Shakespeare and uh, just the plays of, of William Shakespeare, uh, by whom, of course, I mean Sir Francis Bacon. We won't go into that necessarily, but um, and Shakespeare helped me realize things about the way my own mind worked and about the way people behaved around me. Um, it's all there. It really is. I remember um, somebody once asked me, why do you like Shakespeare so much? You know, you're always going on about Shakespeare and getting people to read these plays and stuff. And I was trying to figure it out. All I could say was, it's all there. It's all there in Shakespeare. Uh, Harold Bloom says that Shakespeare invented us. He wrote a book called The Invention of the Human. And he says that the Shakespeare plays, um, and again, this is Bloom, not me, uh, have provided us with basically all of our modern um, ways of looking at things, our, our, our um, oh, what's the word I'm groping for, our motivations, um, our, our joys. I don't know if I'd go quite that far, but um, Shakespeare helped me grow up in a lot of ways. And when I went out into the wide world and started interacting with people and getting jobs and having relationships and stuff, I again and again found myself in situations that I'd read about first in the Shakespeare plays. And it, I think it really helped me navigate them. Um, so those two come to mind. I think one of the main things I get from Shakespeare is just showing that human nature is, you know, almost a constant. Yes. You know, it's like, you know, we think that we're doing what we do through our own unique individuality, but really you see that people have been doing the same things over and over since forever. Oh, yeah. Since the, the, the origin of the human race. Yeah, yeah. 
And um, and I, I would say that um, that's irregardless, you know, of either, you know, whether they've got a bicameral mind or a pre, you know, or the post bicameral mind that we have now. Um, again, if you if you accept James's ideas about um, uh, our psychology, if anything else, the bicameral voices that James claimed uh, directed us uh, before the Bronze Age were coming from the same place as our ruminant consciousness comes now. So I would think that bicameral people would make more or less the same decisions. In a lot of ways, there would be some differences in how they lived and thought. But basically, yeah, you know, build armies, march around, <laughs> conquer people. Uh, our behavior hasn't really changed that much uh, in the grand picture of things, I think, over the last, you know, several thousands of years. Um, details have changed, how we look at, uh, you know, how we live, um, religious yeah. ideas. I mean, we're a little less sociopathic now than we were back when, you know, infant mortality was 70 percent and parents That's could not become that. emotionally attached to their children and raise, raise, raise them like livestock. Yeah, that kind of That's, you know, it's, it's interesting when people were closer to death. I was uh, watching a um, video about um, Nelson, Admiral Nelson. And they mentioned in there that when Nelson was going uh, to sea for the first time, you know, his parents wrote to his uncle who was a ship captain. This was very normal. He was going to be a ship's boy on this. And the uncle writes back, says, oh, what did he do to deserve going into the Navy? But uh, send him along and maybe a cannonball will take his head off in our first engagement and that'll settle him for good and all. And I remember the person making the video said, you know, oh, they're really weird. I think, no, they just saw death every single day. Um, they saw their friends and acquaintances dying of everything from disease to gunshot wounds to gangrene. Not to mention, I believe there were several, there were hundreds of things that you could be executed for in England at the time. Yeah. Uh, so death was like, you know, they, they didn't need to do death meditations to remind them of, of, of their uh, their mortal limitations because you walk down the road and see bodies hanging there, you know, covered in pitch and wrapped in chains uh, to keep them up there all, all the longer. So, um, you know, Nelson used to keep a, a coffin. Uh, that a friend of his had made from the mainmast of, or what was left of the mainmast of the French ship, that uh, the flagship that he defeated at Trafalgar. I don't, I don't remember the name of the ship right now. And uh, had made a coffin for him and sent it to Nelson. Nelson kept it in his stateroom for like months. Look at my coffin. This is what I'm going to be in. Until they needed the room for something else, so he stowed it away. And this was considered a normal gift for people. So yeah. um, there was a, a very different attitude because of that. And uh, but infant mortality that like you say when you're when you're going to lose seven out of ten kids you know i um and i will I suddenly think of edward dutton the only man that talks about when infant mortality crashed and things started going to hell he's like we were at 80 percent infant mortality then it crashed and then everything started going downhill <laughs> yeah yeah i remember reading a book uh the patterns of everyday life by some french fellow i don't remember his name some kind of hit, hit, like uh, economic historian or something. He wrote in the Middle Ages, one of the main causes of death in medieval Europe was tooth decay. Mm. And also he mentioned that a popular children's game at the time was nailing a live cat to a fence and then the kids would take turn trying to butt it to death with their heads. Ah, well, when they got older, they would put cats in a bottle. You heard about that one, right? Cats in a bottle? Yeah, yeah. Well, they would take this was, uh, they did something like this in, um, or right up through Elizabethan and Jacobian times. It was a popular fun sport to do is you take a cat and put it in a leather bottle. You just take the bottle and open up the side, you put the cat in and sew it up and then you would hang it from a tree branch and then you have you and your friends would like use it as a moving target for archery. Oh, nice. And of course they have yeah. the bear baiting. Um, where oh, yeah. Yeah. Cruelty. I mean, it goes back to, you know, before gladiatorial combats and feeding criminals to wild animals and so forth. Well, the Romans had the theory that gladiatorial games would keep their people tough. You know, I don't know. Yeah theory that you know get them uh, uh, habituated to the side of death and guts and stuff but at the same time these people they were keeping tough were the basically our our modern couch potato class yeah going by bread and circuses so yeah we still have the same things that we just watch uh, you know violent movies and so far i don't watch them myself but i've been um in people's homes when they were turning on some of these tv shows and um they um, have a show. Oh, uh, one of these one of these daytime talk show guys, and um, they basically in the show they just bring people on to fight each other. You know, they start insulting each other, and they like Jerry people. Springer or something. Jerry Springer, that was it. I was trying to remember, and uh, I was watching this. I, I used to know this guy. He watched Jerry Springer every day, and if you were unfortunate enough to go to his house at that time of the day, you had to sit and watch Jerry Springer. And I'm watching this, and I'm like, 
dude, if they could, they would give these guys gladii, you know, put a gladius in each of their hands and a shield and just have them go at it. Like uh, when uh, Kirk and uh, Spock and Bones got stuck on the Roman planet. Mm -hmm. um, then they would have been cheering just as much. So there is that visceral, why well, I wonder how, what's the survival value of, of that anyway? The excitement over violence. Um, I don't know. It could be similar to just whatever, like, um, oh, now I can't remember the word for this either. It's like um, the reaction to tragedy. Uh, what is oh, right. it? Catharsis. Oh, right. Catharsis. Eliciting fear yeah. and pity in the audience. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. That's okay. Possibly. Who knows? But at the Who same knows? time, the Greeks always made sure that the violence was off stage. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the arguments the philosophers had against the Roman theory that... Uh, Gladiators make tough, strong, warlike people. As they, <laughs> well, look at the Greeks. You know, they didn't have it. They did okay for a while. Uh, gladiators were occasionally used as uh, soldiers, but I don't think it ever was. It really caught on. Yeah, they they tended not to make very good soldiers, and yeah. I think it started off there'd be gladiatorial combats at funerals of like yes. dignitaries and so forth. So they were sort of like a human sacrifice. Yes, they were actually. I think it went back to Etruscan times where. Um, it would be, you'd send a slave off to the afterlife. And I imagine it started with, well, uh, he wants to go. No, he wants to go. Well, you boys fight it out. Here's a couple of knives. Um, you go, they stopped getting volunteers, I guess. And uh, even Julius Caesar, I believe he was uh, the, the man who first did large scale, or what the Romans considered large scale gladiatorial games, and they were celebrated for the funeral of his daughter. So technically, I believe that right up through um, the end of the, of the games, they were technically a pagan sacrifice. Uh, even yeah, during Christian much. Rome, you know, I mean, the Pope's own gladiators and stuff like that. I, th I think it was the uh, barbarian invaders that actually stopped the gladiatorial games in Rome. I think, no, I think it was a Christian emperor, one of the really weak, feeble ones, like, um, okay. was it Honorius or something? Yeah, there was, there was like some fanatical Christian monk who jumped down into the arena and broke up the fight and then got pelted to death by the <laughs> <audience>. <laughs> I believe that. And so as a result of that, some Christian emperor um, outlawed gladiatorial combat. But uh, the reason why we know this is because we've read lots of books and uh, yeah. getting back to books, yes, exactly. I would like to mention or just kind of bring up the, the whole issue of like scriptures and, uh, you know, it's, it seems to be more just a, a cultural need that creates a scripture because there are scriptures that I consider not to have much profundity at all, like including the Old Testament of the Bible. I mean, you got to read right. for quite a while before you get to any kind of wisdom in well, that. There, you know, there's Proverbs, of course, and uh, Ecclesiastes, and I think these fall into traditional wisdom literature of all lands and ages. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, the thing about the Old Testament is, and I, I accept Russell Gamerkin's idea that it was actually composed um, during the reign of Ptolemy II Philadelphus, um, composed based on uh, the writings and part of uh, uh, Manetho and Barosus. Well, it's got to be based on something much older. Oh yeah, yeah, they did. They did. Uh, they did incorporate a lot of, uh, you know, obviously uh, Hebrew uh, myths, and legends, and stuff like that. But they did invent a lot too. Uh, for example, um, we have the records of a Jewish military colony at Elephantine, I believe, and with a lot of a lot of um, written written evidence of uh, personal names. There's like letters and things like that. Um, interestingly enough, and this and and everything else we have written uh, from from Jewish sources, as far as I know, there's no sign of the name Moses, no sign of the name Aaron. Those are two of the most popular Jewish names today. But these were characters that were basically invented out of whole cloth, probably based on other characters. And yeah, well, there, there were a number of uh, ancient myths with uh, like Myces and, and this kind of thing that were, right. uh, you know, it's sent down the river in the little basket of reeds. And, and yeah, so, and yeah, that's a, that's quite possible. And this was Although also was like one of the oldest fragments of the Old Testament, I think, are certain parts of the Mosaic law, so-called. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Which and, could have been what was on the, in the Ark, the Ark well, of the Covenant. What's interesting, too, is um, as they have letters um, from, again, from this uh, Jewish military colony. And at one point, uh, apparently there had been some trouble with, uh, so there had been uh, some kind of a military um, campaign or something had happened. And uh, the Jews 
temple had been destroyed, and they were writing to the priesthood in Jerusalem saying, hey, we got to rebuild our temple, can you send us some money? So, for example, there was no indication that Jerusalem had to be the only temple. Um, we also know that um, the Sabbath didn't seem to be kept particularly holy, um, and, uh, you know, Yahweh was written of quite openly. There was no, nobody was scared to write down uh, his name. Um, so there, there were a lot of major changes made. And I think at that time, too, the idea of a holy book was records and laws. And it all started when uh, Ptolemy II said, um, hey, you know, I want to collect for the library. We've got like the legends and the holy books of, of, the, of the Mesopotamians here. And we've got the legends and holy books of the Greeks. You know, we've got the Iliad and the Odyssey. I really want uh, to have the Jewish uh, religious texts and holy laws. And they said, great, give us access to the Library of Alexandria. And that's where they started collating everything together. But they drew on a lot of other sources, um, including especially uh, Plato, um, in the construction of the social laws. I mean, the, the, at, once again, you know, Plato's idea of the Republic uh, was probably uh, probably a big a big uh, influence on on the way the Hebrew scriptures were were designed. So I can see where that wouldn't necessarily, from our point of view, be considered spiritual. And and going back to to spirituality, especially, and, and this again relates to the, the idea of bicamerality, you know as well as I that in the old, old days, the good and bad had nothing to do with ethical considerations as we would have today. Good was what the God wanted to do. Bad was what the God did not want you to do. And that was the only, only way to define good and evil. Nowadays, of course, we would say that there are some things that are morally or ethically right and morally and ethically wrong. We get upset if the, the biblical God commands the uh, slaughter of the Amalekites. Um, but at that time, yes, that's good. Kill every man, woman, and child. It's good because Yahweh said so. And if he says, don't kill someone, then it's bad to do it. But there's no idea that, oh, maybe I shouldn't be bashing these babies' brains out against the wall like that, like Yahweh said. But no, he's God. It's, 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 it's okay. Um, our idea of a spiritual book, I think, is a little more sophisticated than that nowadays. Yeah, well, I mean, nowadays, I mean, it's what would it take to have a new scripture? I mean, it's like mm, some be. books, you know, like like Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now, I consider to be much more profound than the Old Testament. But the Old Testament is revered as scripture, and Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now is just another book on people's books right. that is not considered to be sacred at all. Well, it's actually, it's interesting you bring that up, because the first thing that strikes me when you say that is Eckhart Tolle's book is, and uh, I'm not a super familiar with him, but I've read a lot of Alan Watts, which is basically, you know, a lot of... I'm, I'm familiar with his ideas, but these are ideas for your individual enlightenment. This, whereas the Old Testament was a, a book that was designed to create a people. It yes. Was, well, I'm not necessarily even referring entirely to the Old Testament. I'm just referring to just the the whole concept of you know, sacred texts or oh, scriptures. Right. Oh, oh, I think like, like the yeah, Buddhist yeah. texts. They're they're pretty much directed in almost entirely at uh, individual enlightenment, or at least the the Theravadan ones, the Pali ones. Right, right, the real ones. Um, the the um, yeah, the Eckhart Tolle again. Th this is a this is a personal path, and I think our spirituality today is more oriented toward the individual. Um, yeah, it has to be enlightenment. Yeah, uh, rather than the group enlightenment. So people certainly aren't identifying with the tribe, at least right. uh, not as a, a geographical geographically bounded right group of so, people. So a new scripture would have to be something like that, um, unless you were trying to rekindle that connection, that tribal connection, which I do see kind of growing again. The Internet, for example, you know, um, we're many hundreds of miles away, and yet the Internet gives us a chance. As you yourself said, it's kind of like Deva powers, you know, yeah. communicate. So you can keep in touch with a group of people and um, so, you know, maybe we could reignite that somehow. I would love to see that, but it would, um, yeah, but a new scripture, that's a tough one. That, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, I, I'm sincerely hoping it won't turn out to be the Bronze Age mindset. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that one had sort of like some quasi-scriptural, like, uh, reverence in certain circles. But... Um, yeah, I, I mean, it would sort of be sort of Old Testament stuff. I mean, it's all full of, uh, you know, violence and, and gore and so forth. But, uh, yeah, I, I really don't know. what It would take some sort of crisis point, you know, getting back to the, the Battle for the Mind book, where it takes a crisis point to really change direction or to cause a significant shift in perception. 
I think it's going to take maybe a, some kind of crash or, you know, just a, a, an age of just really severe disillusionment and confusion and being lost and then just have the right book that people are ready to hear that kind of creates a sense of meaning and belonging in them. You know, it's just like it's sort of like saying, you know, what the new religion would be, what the next religion to come along will be. I don't think uh, science has really defeated religion in any way. It's religion has had its or uh, science has had its day, but it seems to be on the wane now. So we're getting back to Pavlov now, too. We need society needs to have a trauma so that it'll reach out for something. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably what it's going to take. Well, I suddenly thought of um people trying to write new scriptures, because people do all the time. I'm suddenly reminded of uh, Nietzsche's book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which was yeah. written in a very pseudo-biblical sort of way. Um, I think that was kind of his attempt to help us past, um, you know, the nihilism that he saw coming. Um, and actually, I'm reminded of uh, Murdoch Murdoch's book, Always the Horizon. Did you read that? Yeah. No, I haven't read it yet. I haven't read very much of anything. You're just saying, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you the truth. I haven't read a whole lot of it. I began reading it. I, um, you know, it's it's out on the internet in a really poorly edited PDF file, uh, which of course lends it a certain. But again, I, I see the same effort there. These are people trying to reignite a, a, some kind of a spirituality in the face of the modern world, you know, in, in, in a time when, I mean, when, when people were reading, like, well, any, any scripture, I think, when it was written, was always written from the best understanding of the time. So when people wrote, uh, like, the New Testament, and uh, Christ was lifted up into the clouds, they thought, well, it was, he physically went up into the clouds um, and went to heaven, which is just, just above there, above the firmament, that blue stuff. Um, whereas today, we know that even at the speed of light, he wouldn't be out of the galaxy yet. Um, but at, so so people need need to or there is always that underlying knowledge that we have of our world that we assume that our religious ideas have to fit into. And to, to make that more clear, I was actually just talking about this with someone uh, last night on the phone about how um, people have a need for higher powers. It's wired into us, but no one can really believe really believe that the, above the sky there is heaven, but they can believe in flying saucers and reptilian aliens. Um, the gods had amazing powers. We don't believe in magic powers anymore, but we believe in the power of physics and of, of technology to transcend space and time. And so now the, the powerful beings that we seek interaction with are in many cases what we would call space aliens or interdimensional yeah. travelers. Um, yeah, that's, I've been trying same, to tell our friend Brian about uh, about uh, that theory that um, what what used to be called or what are called greys, for example, now might have just been, you know, elves or, you know, the little people, that kind of thing. You know, the changelings are right. You know, right, they've, right. Been, they've been abducted and, and replaced right. and this sort of thing. I think and yeah, that, people I mean, people have to take the same phenomena and interpret them according to their, you know, their belief system, which nowadays is more or less scientific. I was going to say, I think Haru would say rather it's the elves that are now called aliens rather than the aliens called elves. But, um, you know, I, I was once, uh, you know, I worked in an art gallery for many years and actually several different galleries. And one day a man came in and uh, he was obviously a biker and he was looking at the art on the wall. And one of the, one of the uh, uh, drawings, it was actually a drawing, was of a skeleton in flames riding a motorcycle. And he said, oh, that's kind of me. And I said, what happened? He says, well, I was in a really bad accident on my motorcycle and I was actually dead at the scene. Uh, they were able to bring me back. He said, but while I was dead, he said, I, I went up into the sky. There was a bright light and I was sitting in my grandmother's lap. Oh, the standard out of no, near death experience. Yeah. yeah. And then he said, and then she told me that I had to go back. And then I woke up on the operating table and he kind of looked down half ashamed. and He says, yeah, but they, they said that's just all electricity in the brain, I guess. And I said, well, dude, what do you think this is? He goes, what? I said, listen, you know that your brain is creating all this, right? Because you have certain electromagnetic impulses reach your eyes, which are sensitive to them. The air is compressed and expands so that you hear my voice. And this is all happening at the at, right at the you know the, the the eardrum and at the optic nerve. This is all just translating to electricity. I said, it's, it's all electrical impulses in your brain. And I never saw such a smile. He was so happy. He's like, yeah, that's right. He walked out with this this wonderful lilt in his step. 
but um, ultimately our perceptions come down to these electrical impulses. So, yeah, well, at least according to our current belief system. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> the devil's advocate always. <laughs> yeah, I have. I read. Um, I got it written down somewhere. I can't remember who said it. It was somebody who was, you know, relatively famous. Um, they said that um, a good choice for a scripture for modern Western people would be James Joyce's Ulysses. Really? Yeah, he said it's got all that it, all that is required to become like a um, a religious text for the you know the modern Western person. And I mean, I mean, you you could do worse than than pick Ulysses. I mean, I've I've read it. It's it's some parts of it are hard to read and understand, which I think is good. I mean, you want some kind of ambiguity and uh like mystery in in a yes. good scriptural text you don't want it all just to be clear cut and easy to understand well you know that's that's interesting and it, it kind of brings up getting back to this idea of our, our individual quests now i think that there are books that act as scriptures you know for many people um you know we, we've said before about how people are religious even when they don't know it, you know, for most people, their religion is their money or their job or this or that. They might not call it that, but people have a uh, an impulse toward this. And I think that there are books that are um, sorry about that. There are books that um, act as scriptures for people um, like Lord of the Rings or Shakespeare. I mean, Harold Bloom called himself an unabashed bardolater, you know, a worshiper of the bard. And if you read his his works, um, you just see this. This really religious reverence for the works of Shakespeare uh, dripping through. So for him, that did function. And um, I don't know. I remember reading a science fiction story years ago about a future where all they had was like Lord of the Rings. So this became the religious book, you know, and they were yeah. trying to model their lives. So personally, I think what could be uh, what is worthy of being a religious scripture would be uh, the Book of the New Sun. I mean, it's got it's got everything in there. No. Or I've I've written before, you know, that, that even Moby Dick. I mean, it's it's probably oh, yeah. Upanishadic in 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 its message. Now that that's another book that just uh, just bowled me right over when I read it. Um, when I you know I was um, at the time I was in uh, weird circumstances as always, and I was staying at a friend of mine's house and sleeping on his couch. I was there for uh, I forget how long. It was like a couple of weeks, and um, but he had all these books that he had inherited from uh, his gay uncle. And apparently he had a gay uncle. And according to evolution, the purpose of the gay uncle is to accumulate um, uh, material possessions that he can then pass on to his nephews and nieces without having his own children kind of deal. And apparently his gay uncle did quite well because, of course, he didn't have a family to spend money on. And when he died, he had all these uh, collection of the world's greatest books. I don't know if they were very fancy bindings that they make limited editions, including one of Moby Dick. So I was stuck there for a while. So I'm like, well, I'll just read this Moby Dick. And... Um, Man, I was surprised at how good that book is and how modern in many ways it is. But you're right, it's got that that Upanishadic sweep to it at times. And there, there's also still it's uh, rather Shakespearean, especially Ahab speeches. Oh, yeah. Well, he was uh, one story I read was that uh, Melville had trouble with his eyesight. And so someone had given him like a big print edition of Shakespeare and he's just like, oh, thank you. Thank you. And he had just like been soaking himself in Shakespeare just before he he uh, wrote Moby Dick. And as you know, many of the chapters, or at least some of the chapters are almost set up like scenes in a play. Um, yeah. I love that, you know, I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. You know, there's a grandeur there um, in, in Ahab and, um, you know, I, I don't want to start comparing it to, to, to Paradise Lost or anything like that, but um I love that whole that whole Gnostic thing about, you know, uh, reality and pasteboard masks and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, to, to strike back, strike through the mask, um, the anger, he even threw his pipe away at one time. You know, his pipe that gave him so much peace, but he just he didn't want to be peaceful. Remember when little Pip almost tames him and he's like, I can't listen to you, man, because he's with the cat. Let's just go home. You don't need to do this. And Ahab is touched. He almost turns away and he says, no, I don't want to be convinced. You know, I don't yeah. want to be cured. That was uh, yeah. That's that's sort of like the Antichrist has to go against his conscience. You know, the voice of God has to be rejected. You know, or Severian, the Christ-like figure, doing things that are, let's say, morally um, ambiguous to say the least. Yeah. Well, in order to be, uh, I can't remember what the name of the uh, the the supreme leader was. What was Autarch. 
Yeah, the autark. I mean, you you had to uh, have the experience the full spectrum of human experience, you know. So he started. He starts off as literally a torturer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then becomes you know the messiah by the end of the the story. Well, he was the uh, the epitome of Earth. Because, of course, all the autarchs, uh, their succession was through taking the Alzebo, you know, in the little file, so that they would absorb all of the genetic memories, the, 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 the memories, which is something that uh, Frank Herbert did, I think, in Dune. They had a similar idea. But, um, yeah, and the, just the whole way he moves through life as a, you know, as a torturer, a member of the Order of the Seekers of Truth and Penitence, um, as it was uh, more accurately called, um, you know, you, you grow up and it's like, oh, yeah, just normal, just play another leg, you know, break this person on the wheel, nothing to it. And by the end of the, the, the you know, the books, he doesn't want to do that anymore. He suddenly wakes up that, you know, this isn't nice, you know, especially yeah. when he was he was in jail himself at one point. I thought that was that was very interesting, too, when he was locked in the vincula and he's like, suddenly he's like, and then actually right at the beginning, really, when they locked him in after he killed Thecla, he had those same things like, oh, wow, now I know what it's like. I'm on the other side. And how this kind of kickstarted an awakening in him. Yeah, well, I mean, what maybe started kickstarting it was just the the mercy that he felt for Thecla, and so he allowed her to kill herself instead of uh, making her yeah. die slowly. You knew but we're getting into a, maybe an obscure book that most people haven't haven't read on um, to their loss. I think it's it's really a, just a, a masterpiece of American literature. It's up there in the same ranks with Moby Dick. I think. I think so. I think so. Yeah, plus he was better at avoiding some of the corny stuff that uh, Melville included <laughs> well, in, in Moby Dick. He, yeah, there there is some corniness in there. Well, the 19th century was a cornier era, and yeah. um, I think Melville um, really, you know, coming back to the book, which I've done recently, I see its humor. There's so much of Moby Dick that's actually very funny. He has such a light touch, and there's so many cute little bits um i i love the, there's and again this is way before television but i could almost see that some of these would make great televised scenes um when uh Quiquag was first um being hired on board the pequod and he jumps up in the boat and he, he tosses the harpoon across uh, the deck over the tops of the, the the two captain's hats and he, you know he hits the tiny little crumb floating there and uh, Melville describes, as I recall, the two captains are like jumping around and you think they're going to be scared because there's this guy throwing harpoons. Instead, it's like, quick, sign him up, sign him up, sign him up. You know, they're excited. it was excitement about getting the guy. But it was just yeah. that little bit of, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, little bits like that all through the book. And, of course, that, you know, the whole thing about uh, the two of them sharing a bet together. Yeah. So. And then there was uh, the scene when uh, Stubb is going aboard the, I think it's the French vessel, and has to have the translator, and he's just insulting the guy in the translator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the position of a translator is often yeah. a very delicate one. Something a bit babyish about you. <laughs> <laughs> he says you look so young and elderly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, also, as I mean, we've we talked about reading... Uh, like uh, mundane or what is it, secular or you know non sacred texts as scripture, but I mean you can do the same thing. Like one of the most important books I've read, which is on the pile here somewhere, let's see, is uh, this one. But I have, I mean, you read it mainly because this is the most influential book in Western Western civilization. This this book has had a bigger impact on Western civilization than any other book. So it's good to read it, even if you don't believe half of it or right. you know, the whole, you know, Jesus died for our sins or, you know, Jehovah God is right. you know, Lord Almighty and the Jews are the chosen people and so forth. You, right. you don't have to believe any of that really, but still, I mean, it helps you to understand the the civilization that you're living in. Yes. Just, yeah. just by reading it as the literature. Yeah. Well, uh, getting back to Harold Bloom, uh, one of my favorite critics, he was uh, he said, if I was trapped on a desert island, if I could only have one book, I'd have the complete works of Shakespeare. If I could have two books, I'd also have the King James Bible. And um, it's generally considered, um, I, I hang out on Lit, on uh, 4Channel. Not 4Chan, 4Channel. It's uh, family friendly. And uh, oh, nice. on, on Lit, um, Melville, Gene Wolfe, uh, and uh, Harold Bloom are all held up as uh, they're they're highly regarded. 
Um, oh, when Harold Bloom died. Oh, he, they, that, that was a sad day on Lit. But um, yeah, he, he said, and this is generally, I think, acknowledged by anyone who can think about it logically, that uh, the Bible has had such an immense influence on our society. Like you say, you really can't understand our culture very well unless you're familiar with it. And every single generation was familiar with the Bible um, up until very recently. I mean, I read a lot of older stories, not even that old, like P.G. Woodhouse is one of my favorite writers. And there's another guy who's actually had uh, a great deal of influence on me. He's usually dismissed as a comic writer, but he's like a writer's writer. Um, it's an amazing command, amazing command of, of, of the language, uh, a master stylist. And his books are full of uh, biblical references. Um, everybody knew what he was talking about at that time. And it, it was a way of connecting with your society. Whether, whether you were a, a real, real believer or you were the village atheist type, you still knew your Bible. And uh, it, it, it's, uh, again, a common part of our, our heritage, heritage. I think everybody should have at least some grounding in it. Um, but yeah, the, uh, Woodhouse, Woodhouse, uh, was interesting. He was, he was an amazing writer and, um, he wrote a lot of things very innocently. He could get away with stuff that no one else could. He wrote what I consider to be the dirtiest line in, uh, in G rated literature, uh, where he was describing somebody who went outside to have a cigarette. And, uh, the way he put it was, I sat in the garden sucking on a fag meditatively. Only Woodhouse could say this and get away with a straight face and get away with it. And of course it was perfectly innocent. But, um, yeah, it's, um, Woodhouse had, um, an insight into human nature, um, that I think also, I, again, I, you know, he's, he's, he's very deceptively simple in his writing. I mean, Woodhouse basically wrote the same book a hundred times, you know, I mean, it, you know, like Herman Hesse. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Same that's, book that's, over and over again. And there's another guy who, uh, again, you know, his Siddhartha was, uh, like I said, mentioned earlier, was, was a book that first got me. Hmm, these Eastern ideas, this is something, this is what eventually led me to, to uh, um, Taoism, Zen, and then I met you, and uh, you turned me on to uh, Theravada, and even taught me how to pronounce it properly. Yeah, um, good. Although I, I noticed, you know, I we've talked about this before, I have trouble with pronunciation because up until I met you and a few other people, I didn't have anyone to talk about this stuff with. I just read about it. And uh, I notice I tend to put my emphasis on the penultimate syllable. Like I would say Nargajuna. And yeah. you say Nargajuna? Yeah, you... Nargajuna. Yeah, I would say Nargajuna or... or uh... Yeah, that's, that's one of the main ways that people mispronounce uh, like Pali and Sanskrit is they just pronounce it the way it would be if it were an English word when really they had very different, uh, even, even the poetry, it's not even based on accents like, like English poetry. Pali poetry is based on length and shortness of the vowels. Ah, interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's a completely different way of uh, pronunciation, really. Have you ever composed any Pali poetry? No, I was never good enough at, at Pali to, uh, to write poetry. Uh -huh. It yeah. seemed like it'd be a cool exercise. Yeah, well, I'm I'm really not much of the the poetic temperament or the artistic temperament. I've got a little bit, but uh, I'm more philosophical than uh, than religious and uh, more scientific than artistic. I think. Well, I was going to say you, you you had a scientific education. You always kind of reminded me a little bit of Severian. I hope you don't take that badly, but you always had a I I don't know. I always got a kind of a Severian vibe off of you. Yeah, I can kind of I can kind of identify with Severian when I read the book, the the book of the New Sun. Especially, mm. you know, and part of it, you being part of an order or were part, you know, part of the Sangha for a while yeah. and uh, functioning in it as best you could, but at the same time being very clear eyed about it. Yeah. In other ways. So. Yeah, I think still my favorite novel. I mean, if I had like a, a list, I've, I've composed lists of, you know, my top 10 favorite this or that. And uh, I, I still am inclined to consider Dostoevsky's *The Idiot* to be my favorite novel, which is religious literature, and it's uh, yes. at one level it's an apocalypse, and at another level it's just symbolic of um, Christ and the devil competing for the soul of the sinner and so forth. Right. And um, even though I'm not a Christian, maybe if I were a Christian, I'd like it even better. But uh, also another one that comes to mind, like apocalyptic literature, is *Lord of the Flies* which is just flat oh, yeah. out apocalyptic literature and it's just totally symbolic and you've got intelligent college educated people who can read it and they're just clueless that, that there's any symbolism at all that there's any kind of um you know symbolism of you know 
um, the end of the world, you know, the island is is the world and the, the boys right. on the island are the human race and right. the signal fire on the top of the mountain signifies religion. And, you know, that's the whole you know, Lord of the Flies itself is is essentially, you know, the devil, you know, the monster, which is uh, oh. very real, even though it has no body and just inhabits, you know, some corner, dark corner of everyone's mind, you know. And they had me read that book in uh, grade school. Yeah. And the grade school kids, I mean, they're not going to they're not going to know it's apocalyptic literature, but no, no. it's really what it is. We, we didn't get nearly that uh, sophisticated an explanation of it uh, from our teachers, but, but yeah. it sinks in there and it's in there, you know. Yeah. Pretty- and then, uh, like yeah, another book that's read in, uh, like in uh, high school, is uh, like uh, the Catcher in the Rye, J.D. Salinger, and all of, and uh, everything. Everything Salinger wrote was, uh, you know, some kind of religious. You know, he's sort of like Hesse. You know, just there's always this spiritual undercurrent. And uh, um, I remember uh, a friend of mine who was a monk in Burma telling me that uh, he had read in some magazine that um, The Catcher in the Rye was actually Buddhist literature. And I thought that was so ridiculous. I mean, it obviously wasn't Buddhist literature when I read it. And then um, I read what is essentially the sequel to The Catcher in the Rye, which is Franny and Zooey. And yeah, obviously. I mean, you, then you come back and it's, it's obviously a Buddhist book, The really? Catcher in the Rye. Yeah. More Mahayanas than uh, Theravadan. Uh, but, uh, uh, but still. Hmm. No, I, I never read that. That uh, that was one I ducked out on. I um, never got assigned it in school. And um, then I think there there are times when I resist reading a book because I think it's too popular. If everybody's saying, you got to read this, you got to read this, like Catcher in the Rye, there's always at least one Catcher in the Rye thread on Lit. And I'm like, eh. um, But on the other hand, I'm like that with a lot of things. I don't know if you remember the movie Pulp Fiction. Um, yeah. It's a universal labor. It's like, great. But I'm like, I don't want to watch a movie with John Travolta in it. I don't want to see, you know, Vinny Barbarino. Um, yeah. Although I, Vinny Barbarino was a heroin addicted hitman in the movie. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that. I, I you know, I, if I'm not interested in something, I just disconnect from it entirely. Um, Richard Bach, and there's another guy who wrote a book. Um, if you remember, um, he wrote Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Yeah. Which, and then he wrote um, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. Yeah, illusions. Illusions. That was it. And uh, there was a line in Illusions where he said, "If you if you want to remove a cloud from your thinking, you just stop thinking about it." Um, which that that kind of resonated with me at the time. So if there's something I don't want to bother with, I just remove it from my thinking, kind of thing. Like, I just have a tendency. So that's what happened with Catcher in the Rye. That's what happened with uh, with Pulp Fiction. Until one day, seven or eight years after the movie had come out, I was at somebody's house and they said, "We're going to watch this." And I'm like, "Okay." And by the time I got out, I said, "Oh, well, that's actually a very well made movie." um surprise surprise kind of yeah. deal once in a while stuff that's popular is good but most of the time yeah yeah i'm kind of experiencing the same thing and that i'm watching episodes of game of thrones now oh, which God. Is i resisted watching that for years and years and, i'm still uh, resisting so <laughs> yeah it's i mean mainly what you hear about it is like soft core pornography or, or something you know there is a lot of nudity and so forth in it but um i mean it's based largely on the wars of the roses where it's like the two main families that are at war are the Lannisters and the Starks in Game of Thrones, which is Lancasters and Yorks, you know, and yeah. just this the sheer ruthlessness of the stuff, you know, this poisoning each other and having each other's murdered and so forth. I mean, that kind of stuff really was pretty much the status quo in politics a lot of times oh, yeah. in history, like like, you know, Roman Empire or even the late Republic or, you know, medieval Europe, all that. I mean, it was just people really were especially at the top just that ruthless just in the in the acquisition and maintenance of power oh yeah so, i mean it's it is sort of a reflection on on history in a way oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's also it's also entertaining so yeah i've been watching that well people I'm not a monk politics. anymore i can get away with it that's right well people people uh people love politics people are always interested in politics and um i, I had no i didn't know he was basing it on the war of the roses but again yeah, partly it, in part not entirely but in I, part. I can see where that would that would drive a lot of it um i'm not i've never seen any of the the uh shows i tried reading the books you see because i'm more you know when i when i hear these things i go like oh, i'll read the book and yeah. Mark, which is usually better well, I don't think so in this case, actually. The, the, from the way you're describing it, the, the, the show is probably more fun than the book. Martin, I'll tell you, I've never been a huge fan. And, of course, he's made it very big. And, uh, you know, they talk about him on Lit a lot. But 
he wrote uh, something, a series of stories about a character called Haviland Tough. They were collected in a book called Tough Voyaging, and it was about this character. And I enjoyed those stories a great deal, um, but I never really liked anything else he wrote. And um, I think the reason why I liked the Haviland Tough stories was because he later said that he was consciously trying to write a Jack Vance-style story, much as The Book of the New Sun was Gene Wolfe trying to consciously write a Jack Vance-style story. Um, Vance is another, another very uh, influential uh, author in my life. But when I tried to read the uh, Game of Thrones books, um, again, there's the violence and the porn, which I never really, I don't think that including sex and violence in a novel is necessarily clever or fun. I mean, I can see if, it, if it's necessary to drive the action, but I mean, I, I think he was just writing it because the fanboys wanted to read about sex and violence. And um, I, I tend to agree with the ancient Greeks about keeping all of that stuff off stage. You know, it's, it's not necessary. Um, so, yeah, I tried reading the first book, and after a chapter or two, I'm like, I'm not going to read this. Where, why isn't he writing, like, tough voyaging, the tough stories? And that's when I looked it up, and it's like, oh, yeah, well, that was his Jack Vance pastiche. And I'm like, well, that explains it. Even Vance can take a crappy writer and turn him into something halfway decent. Yeah, I'm trying not- to keep the unsavory stuff off stage, though. On the other hand, uh, James Joyce's Ulysses actually has uh, Leopold Bloom taking a dump. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, what was it? Bloom's Day is supposed to be the uh, the day that celebrates a hand job. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. the, you know, it's like it's a big thing over in Ireland and all the pubs are full and they have festivals and readings and, and seminars and, and symposia. Um, yeah, as people uh, stand in the street hoping that some lady will show a well-turned <laughs> ankle. Yes, yes. <laughs> No one wants to see that ankle slot, you know, kind of deal. Things were different then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but, there is a scene in, in Ulysses where there's this lady who's just getting ready to step up onto a carriage, and he's just got his eyes focused for that ankle, you know. Okay. Maybe yeah, some right, calf right, even. Yeah. And then another carriage drives by her right when she's getting into the carriage. He's like, damn. Cock blocked. Happens every time. Yeah. Every single time. What are you going to do? So have you read much Jack Vance? Zero. I've read yep. zero Jack Vance. Oh. I mean, I've I've read, I've looked at uh, Barlow's Extraterrestrials. He's got a few Jack Vance uh, creatures yep. like the Durder and the Noom, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's about that, was, it. that was from Planet, the Planet of Adventure uh, trilogy. Um, he was very influential on a lot of writers. Uh, Gene Wolfe was a big fan. Um, yeah, I would suggest trying the Dying Earth books. And there you'll see a direct link to the Book of the New Sun. It's basically a similar idea. In fact, uh, Gene Wolfe, uh, remember the Book of Gold, when uh, Severian was sent to Master Olten's library uh, to pick up books for Thecla. And they were talking about how a librarian is, is, is picked, and a uh, child goes and he finds the Book of Gold. And um, this, this ties in with what makes a great book. And... Uh, Wolf said he wanted to write the Book of Gold. You know, not for everybody, but for some people, the book that you would reach for again and again with pleasure. And I think he's done that with the Book of the New Sun. Um, yeah, I mean, some parts of it you can't really even absorb it until you've read it a second time. Yeah, you know, like the like the little puppet play that he dreams. When yes, he's in bed with Baldanders. I mean, there's no. I mean, you forget all about it by the time you get to the end if you're like the the normal person. Right, right, yeah. No, and the um, it took me a while to pick up on the fact that Severian is not always accurate in his statements. And uh, at first I think, wait a minute, is this is this just a question of line editing? No, obviously not. This man is a master of the word. He's doing this deliberately because there's one point where Baldander said, I never dream. Yeah. And there was also when he slept next to Severian, he goes, well, that explains my dreams. I slept next to a headman. And I dreamed of blood and death, or, or words to that. Oh, I thought I thought Bald Anders accused him of stealing his dream. Hmm, see, I have to go back and read it again. Um, yeah. I, I thought I thought Bald Anders had accused him of causing his dream, um, huh. but I remember there was at least one other point in the book where Bald Anders said, "I never dream." Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's. Some some novels. There's one called The Wreckage of Agathon by John Gardner that I wrote that I read many years ago. That was, that was probably in a cave in Burma, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, it's like he's telling this story, and then there's certain aspects of the story, like 
Um, you know, his wife is very unfaithful, but he gets all these opportunities and he's like steadfastly faithful. And it's like, I, I'm, you know, did that, it, he must be making that part up. And then at the end, um, he, he shows the manuscript gets shown to somebody else and like his ex-wife or something. She said, that didn't happen like that at all. <laughs> it's like the whole story is just one guy's desired version of, of what happened. Right. Right. Kind of like uh, Rashomon. If you remember that. No, I don't. Oh, um, good movie, good book. Um, but it's basically about, basically, I, I don't want to spoil it for you because you might watch the film, but it's basically showing how different witnesses see different things and have different ideas of what happened, sometimes drastically different. And it's all based yeah. a lot on what they want to happen or what they think should happen. Um, you know, the, the classic... Um, well, you remember the the uh, the gorilla basketball video, right? No, they used to show in psych class. Um, they they basically they show you a video, and uh, you know, spoiler alert, it's going to spoil it for you. And they show like a bunch of a group of people bouncing basketballs and passing them around, and they're, you're told, all right, try to count how many times the basketball was passed. And the film goes for like five minutes, and about halfway through, somebody in a gorilla suit walks out into the middle of the whole thing, waves, and walks back again. 50% of people will not see the gorilla. I've shown this to people and I said, what'd you think of the gorilla? What gorilla? And I have oh, to- I figured they just lose count and what, being distracted by the gorilla or some such. Well, 50% of them are, but 50% of people simply don't see the gorilla. And I've tried this on people and the first person I tried it on, they simply didn't see the gorilla. They were like, I think they passed the basketball 16 times. And like, well, what about the gorilla? What gorilla? You know, the, the, the gorilla just comes out and gets involved in the whole situation. So, um, yeah, it's 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 amazing how um, we we uh, color our memories. I mean, we're not even necessarily lying. Um, this is simply what we perceived because, again, it's all electrical impulses, and it's uh, being influenced by all the other electrical impulses, I guess. So. Yeah. Well, John Gardner, I'm gonna look him up. Yeah, he wrote he wrote better books than the Wreckage of Agathon. I mean, I didn't like it just because it was so historically <laughs> inaccurate. Right. You know, it's this Athenian couple are they're like uh, and he's an ambassador to Sparta, you know, so and then just they're talking about they they friended up with some helots and and it was just so there were so many anachronisms that it just kind of wrecked it. His his uh, his novel uh what is it uh what's the Grendel? Oh, which is, you know, it's I like the, the story of Beowulf from Grendel's point of view. Yeah, okay, he wrote. I thought the name was familiar. Yeah, I didn't yeah. read the yeah, but I, I read that one. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, huh. it's the same guy who wrote it. Oh, okay. Ambassador to Sparta. Yeah. Uh, they, they had something like that, but it was um, it was actually more sort of a council thing. Well, yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, what's his name? Alcibiades was uh, his family were the traditional, um, what do they call them, Zeno something. Basically, uh, if there was a Spartan turned up at, in Athens, you'd go to this guy to look out for your interests. It was the closest thing they had to like, you know, I mean, they had heralds and stuff, and obviously an official embassy could be sent, but they did have people who were regularly looking out for the interests of the other city-state, and there was no opprobrium attached to this, even if the two states were at war, this was simply because you had a similar guy in Sparta doing it for Athenians that would show up kind of deal. It was a kind of an interesting system, but uh, yeah. I know that from reading books, or books. you know it from reading books, and it I know it from just now from uh, hearing you. <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, yeah. well it's made it up, but uh, no. Um, <laughs> somebody was saying that about me once. I said, he knows so much. Says, how do you know what he's saying is accurate? It's like, oh. it's and all of a sudden, I mean, uh, we should probably bring this to an end fairly soon, because okay, we've been yeah. at it for an hour and 20 minutes, but um Time flies. I was reading a book on Indian philosophy. It was based on medieval philosophy text, so it had the same format. And uh, one of the uh, the main topics of debate among the various religious philosophical schools of India was what are the valid criteria for truth? And um, all of the orthodox Hindu schools would have to include Veda. I mean, the scripture is just is infallible reliable truth because you know the hindus believe that the the vedas existed um forever you know they're eternal and that uh the the sages who who wrote it down or who you know composed the hymns were simply channeling 
what was already right. there in the in the ether, essentially. Very Jamesian. Yeah, and it's only the sort of the nihilist sects, you know, are saying that uh, you know that's you, know, you cannot rely on scripture. That uh, you know you have to rely on personal experience, which or and and there's like logic and so forth, and uh, and then I guess uh, some of the real extremists were saying there just is no criterion for truth, sort of like the the Greek skeptics. Hmm. Yeah, the um, the importance of uh, some books to the point where you're not even allowed to question them, and you don't even think of questioning them. Yeah, it's, like the Bible for yeah. many for a thousand years. In the West, well, you know, if, if though if um, Julian James is correct in his idea of uh, human mental functioning, um, this is a natural a natural thing to happen because you know during the bicameral period that he posits, um, there's no evidence of things like charms, spells, amulets, um, prayers that are that are um, in, uh, invocatory. I don't know if that's a word. But prayers, in other words, that you're trying to get the God to do something because you heard the voices of the gods all the time. You didn't have to ask them anything. But we know after the bicameral mind broke down, that's when they started, you know, it's, I think it says somewhere in the Psalms, you know, where, where, where's the God that used to walk next to me? You know, my heart panted for you like the heart pants for water um, when it's been running around all day or words to that effect. And the people that were still bicameral were sought out because they were what we would we were called prophets. So they would follow them around and write down, you know, what's God saying now? What's God saying now? What do we do about this? And, uh, the, you know, the, uh, Plutarch wrote about uh, the cessation of the oracles. Um, but the Greek oracle system, which was amazingly important in the ancient world, um, is supposedly a remnant of, like, you know, it was a remnant of the bicameral mind. Um, and because we were bicameral originally, we have this hardwired need for uh, validation. We need to hear a voice telling us to do something or that we're good because we do it. So, um, and so when we no longer heard the voices, we turn to these scriptures, people writing down stuff. Well, he heard what God said or goddess or whatever. Um, so we're going to do this. And then, of course, eventually the bicameral mind breaks down entirely. You're left with drugged out kind of uh, trances, in which you still can, I think, in some cases. Uh, we, we won't start on I Ayahuasca will be another video, perhaps. But, um, you know, I think uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, altered states of consciousness through drugs and herbs and so forth uh, were so popular in religion, because it was an attempt to reconnect with this bicameral state. Um, so, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense in, from, from this point of view that we, you would be creating scriptures and, and just zealously hanging on to them. Um, and, of course, this is also when people started wearing charms. And because you knew all these creatures, all these evil spirits and good spirits were around. I mean, Grandpa talked to them all the time, and you might have even heard them as a kid. Um, but suddenly they're gone. Where are they? They're there. You know, I better have yeah. an outlet. I think there's always been some sort of, uh, you know, that you'd have bards, verbal, you know, oral traditions long before there were anything written down. And uh, yes. I think I think the main survival value, just from like a Darwinian point of view, is you just have everyone in having the same paradigm, the same belief system, which unifies the culture. Group selection. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. I mean, when the culture is divided, I mean, it's obviously a house divided against itself and, and gets weakened like like nowadays or, um, you know, Pagan Rome, when Christianity was on the the ascendant, it was uh, yeah, it was just very just fractured and and just ripe yeah. for destruction. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. No, um, there's um, uh, a very great truth in the idea that human beings are like bees or ants in a lot of ways. Um, we really are when we're at our best. Our societies are locked together with a common paradigm. I mean, obviously we're a lot more sophisticated than bees or ants, but uh, when it's functioning properly, that, that is when we were at our height as a civilization, no matter what civilization you're talking about, is when people shared a paradigm, they shared a, 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 a worldview. Um, and uh, this, this helped inform all of their decisions, all their ideas. Um, it's why in traditional American culture, you could leave your lawnmower out in your backyard. I mean, it would get rained on, but no one's gonna take it. Um, you know, or leave something out on your front porch or your bicycle out in your, in your yard and, and because people are not going to cross over your lawn because they know that that's your property line. There's nothing physically stopping anyone from walking right over your lawn, but they, there is a moral authority. 
you know, we've talked about that before, moral authority long ago, that wonderful scene from the movie Cartoon at the very end where Charlton Heston is killed by the spear, but he's able to, just his moral authority is able to back off hundreds and hundreds of these guys that are all much more heavily armed than him, but he shows up like, oh, until finally the spell breaks. And uh, that's the situation we're in now. The spell is broken and the results are not good. Yeah, well, maybe we'll hit the crisis point and uh, a new scripture will arise and uh, unify us all. But it's it's going to be it's going to take some doing. Well, God and Pavlov willing, um, you know, yeah. and Darwin. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. But I, I would add that it's a big universe. It's a really big world. And um, this sort of thing is going. I don't think it's going to happen in a uniform way across the whole planet, but here, there, and everywhere, it's already happening in a lot of places. I wouldn't want to be in uh, Rwanda right now or the Ukraine. Um, yeah, well, I mean, Russia is becoming more strongly orthodox and unified in its worldview. Yeah, yeah. I guess um, India is becoming more fundamentalist in its Hinduism also. Yeah, yeah. And there are stirrings even in the, even in the West, you know. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Interesting times. Yeah, I agree. That's it's uh, not entirely bad. It's it's just interesting as heck. Uh, yeah, it depends on where you are. You know, keep your Glock handy just in case. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I should I should name it Terminus Est. <laughs> I don't know, nine millimeter man. I was always a forty five ACP guy myself, but yeah. Well, I wanted something that's something concealable. So right, right. Well, you know, I was, I've was i been thinking of uh, moving to a, uh, an open carry state, but I always said to myself, well, what kind of gun would I get? I'd get like a, a brace of flintlock pistols, you know, big old flintlock horse pistols. Like, wait a minute, you know, prime the pan, click, click. click. Yeah. No, that, that's my kind of gun, you know. Yeah, well, a Glock holds 15 rounds, just one little gun. So. Uh, nothing like that 75 caliber rock <laughs> that you're shooting out from here. <laughs> yeah, might as well just pack a sword. There's that, too. There's that, too. I have to take up fencing lessons. And, of course, I always wanted to have a blunderbuss like Uncle Fester had in the Adams Family. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess uh, we've uh, shot our wad with regard to uh, literature. So uh, let's, let's, let's call it good. It's, it's almost exactly, uh, well, a little shy of an hour and a half. Wow. That's uh, pretty good. You may have to edit it down. Um, well, probably not. It's, that takes uh, actual effort. <laughs> Groovy. So, yeah, I appreciate the talk, man. You're always uh, 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 a treasure trove of information. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm very glad to have been here. It's always a joy to talk to you, and uh, I do enjoy uh, having conversations with people that um, uh, test me as far as my pronunciation goes of uh, words that I otherwise would never have a chance to use. I'd never yeah. get a chance to say, Norgajuna. Or uh, Madimaka. I'm trying yeah. to get better at these words. And of course, you did teach me how to say Theravada. So, uh, with yeah. all this, I'm extremely. Although, good. technically, it's Theravada. Theravada. See, Tera. I'm improving. Again, this is, this is wonderful. Yeah. Theravada. I do appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, he is pronounced like, has the A sound in Pali. Theravada. Sanskrit, also, I think. Well, I can start right, doing maybe. some Pali lessons online. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, maybe we should do this again. And uh, anyone who likes this one should uh, go back and look at our old one on Hegel, which was. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was one of my favorites. Well, maybe we'll shoot for next weekend if you'll be around. Yeah, it's possible. We'll stay in touch. All right. All right. Thanks very much.